At Plymouth Plantation in Plymouth, Massachusetts, there is a living museum in which it seeks to present life as it was in the early 1600s, soon after the pilgrims arrived. Now, in the English village, there are costume actors that role-play historical characters and to live out the scenes to kind of give you a sense that you've moved into that era. But in the neighboring Wampanoag home site, modern-day members of the Wampanoag tribe actually demonstrate the skills and answer questions about their culture and history. And the center of the Wampanoag home site is a bark-covered longhouse that seats several dozen people, and often there's a tribal elder there who greets and fields questions from the visitors to the homestead. And one of the questions that often is asked is how names are chosen for the members of the tribe. And the elder explains that members of the Wampanoag tribe might have several names in a lifetime, not just one. As a person grew and matured into new skills and responsibilities, and as the community identified and called out their gifts, the person would receive a new name. And over a lifetime, one person might have four or five distinct names, each one noting a season of life and each new name noting a transition in their status within the community. Now, many of us change names too, although probably not as many or as thoughtfully as the Wampanoag tribe did. But consider all the names that you have been known by, those nicknames that have been given and claimed and maybe some have been even discarded. The stories behind the names we bear are often touching, Allison and Andy had narrowed down the choices for the names of their daughter to three, but after the birth last night, decided they just didn't want to rush to pick one. They, they wanted some time to, to spend with her and to, to just to have a sense of getting to know this newest member of their family and letting those uh, encounters let the name emerge for them. But those stories can also sometimes be accidents that have caused names to stick with us. In my first or second week of high school, we had a substitute teacher in one of my classes, and she was going down the list reading roll. I don't, do they even take roll anymore? I don't know if they even do that. They do. Uh, and they were reading the names, and she got to my name, and she paused, which is never a good sign. And she said, Sandra Olaweenie? Now, I was mortified, as only a, th a freshman in high school can be, as my classmates howled at that. So you can imagine that for the next four years of high school and throughout my yearbook in my senior class, I was signed as Sandy Olaweenie. What you doing? I was relieved when graduation came and gave me the chance to leave that name far, far behind. Yes, names are important part of our identity and often bear important stories for us. And as it is for us, so it was in the gospel story today as well. Jesus and his disciples have gone to the district of Caesarea Philippi. It's one of the northernmost points uh, that they'll ever go in their shared travels. The city of Caesarea Philippi lies at the foot of Mount Hermon uh, on today's sort of border region between Syria and Lebanon. And it's a part of the Golan Heights, which Israel now currently occupies. And it's long been a place of worship to the Greek god of Pan. In fact, if you go there today to visit, you can still see the historical sites and the, the carvings in the wall of this massive rock face where all the various little worship centers were and where people went up uh, to, to honor the god Pan. It's a, it is very far from Jerusalem. And it was there that the disciples began to receive a deeper knowledge about Jesus. Now, this is another one of those pivotal stories in Matthew's gospel as Jesus is beginning to prepare his own followers for his own end in Jerusalem. And he's letting the disciples in on what is likely going to happen. Now, referencing a passage from the book of Daniel in which the Son of Man is given this internal dominion over the world after the final judgment, Jesus asked his followers, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they answer, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the other prophets. But then Jesus presses for a more impersonal answer. But who do you say? 
who do you say that I am? Now, at this important transition point, Jesus wants to know who his disciples think he is or what he is. It's the first time that he's, he's actually put this question to them. And it's a question that has stayed with the Christian church ever since. Who do we say Jesus is? In theological formulations, through various creeds, through the hymns and the contemporary songs we sing, to poetry and prose, people have tried to answer that question about Jesus. And for over 2,000 years, we have attempted to nail him down by the, nails we have call, by the names we have called him. God from God, light from light, true God of true God, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, redeemer, the savior of the world, son of God and son of man, the gift of God's gracious love, the ground of our hope, the promise of our deliverance from sin and death, the firstborn of all creation, the firstborn from the dead, brother, partner, Lord, guide, friend. We could come up with a myriad of other names if we were to go around the room now and collect them. And as in that Gaither hymn that Cynthia just sang, there's just something about him that continues to call us to name him so that we can say something about who he is to us. But names can also be roadblocks, can't they? They can become labels rather than descriptions of relationships. We have had a long and often ugly history in the church when we've turned the names of Christ into formulas that must be proclaimed to earn a place at the table or an entry into the fellowship or even to protect people from persecution. Naming the name became the value of importance rather than a life-changing relationship with the one so named. Now, if we read the whole of Matthew's story uh, from today and didn't stop with where we did today, but went on another few verses, we get a glimpse that the name, that naming the name without understanding can often get us into trouble. Because Peter, in the section we read today, appears the hero. You are the Messiah. And Jesus tells Peter that he will be called the rock upon which the church will be built. It seems like a really good day for Peter. But if you keep, and if and it is, if naming the name is all that's important. But Jesus goes on right after these first few verses and begins to then tell him, tell the disciples about his upcoming death. And Peter busts the gut to say, no way, this is not going to happen to the Messiah, not to the living Son of God. It isn't how the story goes. And Jesus calls Peter a new name, Satan. He says, Satan, get behind me. Oh, poor Peter. <laughs> he goes from rock to Satan in a, about three sentences. It's a hard day. But if we're honest, I suspect that many of us would be in the same boat with Peter. It seems Christian faith is a lot more than assigning the right titles to Jesus. Indeed, the story who shows us that sometimes the titles can get in the way of understanding who Jesus is at least as much as they help us. Wrestling and understanding what it meant by the names we call Jesus seems to be critically important. What is it about him that gives definition to those titles, that gives meaning to the names we use? In our baptismal vows, we affirm that we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But what in the world does that actually mean? When we invite people to become disciples of Jesus, to join the church, what do we think we are asking them to do or to be? What do we think we are supposed to do and to be? If we look at our own lives and we ask ourselves whether or not they reflect our confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God? Or do they testify that, well, Jesus is a good man, a great man maybe, even an example to follow, someone to be inspired by, kind of like those prophets of old? David Loos wrote, I suspect that I am not alone in sensing the disconnect between my public confession and my everyday actions. I think most of us also know what, that there's a gap between the words that we say on Sunday and the lies we lead the rest of the week. 
not intentionally and certainly with no malice aforethought. In fact, he says, I suspect that most of us would like the words we say on Sunday not just to align with the rest of our lives, but actually to matter day in and day out to us. So today, I want to ask you to join me in truly pondering Jesus' question. Who do you say he is? How do our lives reveal the answer to that question? That is, how do our relationships, our bank accounts, our time, our energy, and all the rest provide a clue on how we answer Jesus' question? Who do we really say Jesus is? Now, this isn't meant as a well-intentioned guilt trip. Rather, I want us to consider together what we actually mean when we say with Peter that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, or that he is the Lord. As you and I begin our ministry together and we listen for where God is calling us to go, I truly believe that we need to reflect on that, our answers together. What is it about Jesus that lights our lives up? What is it that propels us to live his way in the world? How are we drawn to him and from that relationship sent out into the world? It's really hard to align our lives with our confession of faith if we don't really understand what that confession means. And I suspect that most of us often don't really think very much about it, myself included. It gets to be that it's just rote. We just use the terms and we don't think about what do they actually mean. David Loos goes on to write, this whatever it is that Jesus was and is, it's really hard to put into words that we can understand. And so we do, we come up with titles and we come up with formulations and all the rest, trying to get at the mystery of what God has done in and through Jesus. And that's understandable. But all too often, those words only keep the wild and unpredictable God of love and grace at arm's distance from us. And Jesus remains inspiring and exemplary, but ultimately rather tame and eminently safe. Kind of like the prophets of old seem to us. So I'm not going to answer questions today. I'm going to ask you some. I want you to ponder these over the next few days and weeks and months. Consider what Jesus shows you about God. What does Jesus reveal about God's heart? What does Jesus reveal about what's possible? About us. What does Jesus reveal about living to usher in the kingdom of God? What does he reveal about life and death and the commitment to God's way in the world? What does it mean to look at the totality of our lives, our time and our relationships, our hopes and our dreams, our finances and all the rest, through the lens of both the power and possibilities created by seeing God's heart laid bare in Jesus? I truly want to hear from you. So I invite you to think about these questions and send me an email. Write me a letter. Give me a call. Get together in all the various ways in which you get together in this congregation, in the small group gatherings and in learning places and fellowship groups, and share your answers with each other, listening to and learning from each other. Because as we become more aware of what it is about Jesus that calls us together, we'll be clearer about where it is that Jesus is sending us out as his body set free in the world. When we confess what we believe, we have the opportunity to be caught up in the power of Jesus' love and life. Our confessions becomes words of power that help root us in the love and the possibility that Jesus offers. So I look forward to being in conversation and reflection with you. For I truly believe there is just something about that name. Amen.